This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome back to another episode of Audible Bleeding. Today we have Dr. Vanita Chandra with us. Dr. Chandra is an Associate Professor of Surgery and the Associate Program Director for the Vascular Surgery Fellowship at Stanford. She completed medical school at the University of Chicago and then did her residency and fellowship at Stanford where they asked her to stay on as faculty. Dr. Chandra is also the founder of the Stanford Limb Salvage Initiative called the STEP Program or the Stanford Extremity Preservation Program uh, and is going to talk to us today a little bit about limb salvage among other things. Welcome, Dr. Chandra. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, Can you tell us uh, what led you to go into vascular surgery? Uh, Sure. Well, I think probably many people have a similar similar story, but you know, when I started medical school, I had two rules. One was don't date a doctor, and <laughs> the other was don't be a surgeon. There and I go. broke both rules. <laughs> so my husband's an ER doctor, and um, I decided to go into general surgery with no intention whatsoever to do vascular surgery, except when I was a f- sub I I happened to rotate on vascular surgery and. My attending, I will never forget, allowed me to put a stitch in the proximal anastomosis of an aortic, open aortic repair, and I thought, that's pretty darn cool, but I'm not going to be a vascular surgeon either, as my plan was to be a pediatric surgeon. And then, you know, somewhere along the lines, I, uh, you know, pretty late, actually, I loved vascular surgery, but I was just hell-bent on pediatric surgery, and then I realized, actually, I'm not sure that's sort of emotionally um, tolerable to me. And I, I liked a lot of the aspects of vascular surgery. So I made sort of a, a last minute jump and it's the best decision I've ever made. It's funny. That's really not that uncommon a story. I mean, I came to it late and I can't tell you the number of fellows who are thinking of something else and then just saw the light, you know, when their third or fourth year of residency. I agree. And I think part of it actually, and I know this is kind of a hot topic in vascular surgery. I actually think part of it is branding. I mean, I don't think I really knew what vascular surgery was, even though I put a stitch in the aorta as a medical student. Um, I, I know, you know, I don't know any lay people that do. I think to this day, my parents aren't really sure what I do. And so part of it could be that. You guys have both a fellowship and a residency. And so obviously the branding has to happen earlier for the residency. So what are you doing about that? Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> that's a really key point. And um, I actually think the SVS has been doing a really great job. Their program for medical students is un- unbelievable. And, um, you know, we try to be involved and active in the um, medical school um, in multiple ways in terms of teaching, lecturing, um, you know, career fairs. Um, I've been try- I've been trying to get some interest in a, there's a big surgical interest group. There has not been a vascular surgery interest group specifically yet, um, but I'm working on it. This is Adam. Hi, Dr. Chandra. We'll dive into our topic for today's uh, limb salvage. So uh, tell us a little bit about the Stanford uh, Extremity Preservation Program. Sure. I'm going to back up just a bit um, because I have to say that I, you know, I trained here and I, um, we were, we're a busy program. We do a lot of different things, but, you know, I think like many uh, vascular surgery trainees, I was sort of, we did a ton of complex aorta work. I was super jazzed about it. I still, you know, enjoy that stuff. And I graduated uh, with a, um, and was given this job and the, and the role was, hey, we don't really, no one's leaving, but there's potentially an opportunity to have a new role of a vascular surgeon, but this person has to run the wound care center that's brand new and it's opening up and it has to be a co-director. And I thought, (laughs) like truly yuck. How many years ago was this? When, when did you finish? This was when I first started, so six years ago. Um, And I honestly, I, I, I didn't know a lot about any of that stuff. And we certainly did our fair share of PAD, but it wasn't, you know, a true sort of limb preservation sort of philosophy. And um, anyway, so I kind of got sort of forced into it. This was the opportunity and I had to kind of figure it out pretty quickly. Now I'm sort of a you know, obviously pretty passionate about it. I think it's some of the most complicated, complex care that we provide. And um, and so that's where it sort of came from. So we, I dove right in, we opened up a wound care center, and immediately we had this sort of influx of these super complicated patients. And I was constantly, you know, calling everybody, you know, calling the orthopedic surgeon, calling the ID doctor, you know, calling the plastic surgeon, like trying to coordinate the care for these patients. Our wound care center is relatively multidisciplinary in that there's plastic surgeons there and ID people there. But the actual sort of coming to together of the of minds and I thought you know if you actually if we could actually sit in a room and look at each other 
and talk about these really complicated patients, I bet we'd take a lot better care of them and the decisions would be made quicker. So that's kind of where this whole thing came from. And so I started the STEP program, which is kind of based on tumor board, you know, like we had in surgical oncology, where everybody actually meets. And so we're in one room and we review the images, we review the angio, we review the wound pictures, and we're all there and sort of come up with a comprehensive plan right away. And I think everybody has a lot more weigh in and, and um, it just has, it's just been a really great program. So how did you get engagement from these stakeholders to come to the table? You know, that's a good question. I think that everybody who touches on these patients cares, um, but it's easy to say, oh, well, Vanita is going to be the primary one taking care of it, or, you know, I'm just going to let, you know, ID take care of that one and stuff like that and, and not take a really active role and just sort of let these patients slip through the cracks. The problem with these patients is they need everything, right? They need medical management that's really significant. They need nutritional support. They need endocrine support. They almost always have diabetes. They need a lot of people to be really engaged and involved. And um, and so I, when I reached out to people and said, hey, we're going to have this program that will be a coordinator that will help get everything that you want done for this patient that will help the patient navigate their care through this limb salvage experience and um, will sort of push the process along. But I need you to sort of show up and, and give your opinion and be involved, people were like, awesome, actually. You have like a nurse practitioner or a PA who's the coordinator for the patients or who fills that role? Yes, I have a coordinator um, who um, is not, not a nurse practitioner nor a PA because of financial reasons. <laughs> so it's been a steep learning curve for her. Um, but um, but it's she's she's a person who, who manages everything, keeps everything organized, has a running... Who advocates for the patients? advocates for the patients. She's got, you know, everybody has her on, all the patients have her on speed dial. I couldn't get my MRI, blah, 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 blah. And she can help with all of that. And she also maintains a running database. So for research and sort of critical, you know, and um, um, analysis purposes, we have that kind of data. So you obviously said that when you first started out, this wasn't something you anticipated, you know, or were really looking forward to, but you've embraced it, obviously. So what is it that you've discovered about these patients and this kind of care that uh, that excites you, that uh, you, re you didn't realize it had, you know, before? I think that we all go into medicine, you know, for that sort of cheesy um, – I should say cheesy, but, you know, ultimately because we want to care and help patients, right? That's yes. sort of that cheesy bottom line sort of medical student answer. Mm -hmm. And um, I have never felt so engaged and so clearly, obviously helping patients than with this. I mean, we do a lot of amazing things in vascular surgery, which I also love. You know, you fix an abdominal aortic, complex abdominal aortic aneurysm, you're high five and you feel pretty good about yourself. The patients are like, I think that was cool. Thank you. <laughs> they feel for, worse than when they started. Yeah, just a little bit. You exactly. Know? Yeah. I have no idea. I don't really understand what you did and how you've saved my life, but thanks, you know. Um, and it's, again, we, not that we do these things for the thanks, but, um, but these patients are suffering. They've had wounds for a long period of time. They are feeling this threat and fear of, you know, not being able to walk again, you know, losing their limb. They are demanding of their families and their resources around them pretty significantly. So caring for them and getting them healed in a manner that's, um, you know, a positive effect on their quality of life, they are so clearly, like they see that benefit and they're so truly thankful that it was, it's really, you know, it's, it's emotionally warming. I just want to kind of dive into the nitty gritty of this. Do do multiple practitioners see these patients at every visit? And, and if not, how do you go about documenting wounds and progression of, of, of improvement and recovery? Great question. You know, I think, and there's a lot of ways to do this. There's a ton of like the concept of a multidisciplinary approach to these patients is not new and many people in many places do it really well. Um, it, the way that we've set it up, um, I, I think it's pretty important to have a, a wound care center affiliated or involved. And the sort of concept of wound care centers is a weekly follow-up. And so that's sort of the main touch point for almost all the patients. Now, people are referred to the wound care or the STEP program from all over the system. Um, it's like an epic order. Um, but the majority of patients go through or stay um, sort of being monitored through the wound center. So the wound center has, you know, wound management, 
weekly evaluation of the wound size and data, et cetera, et cetera. And then our step coordinator also is involved in, in following it along the way. And then the step meetings bring together who else, whoever else is needed. You know, foot and ankle is going to do this procedure at this time. ID is involved. We have palliative care at our SEP meetings, which I actually think is pretty important. I've wanted, um, I've been working with physical therapy as well. We have a prosthetist. So all of these people's weigh-in is pretty important, but they don't necessarily need to see the patients weekly. So do you think uh, the, an expertise in vascular surgery uh, helps you to lead this group effectively? Or, you know, what uh, clinical specialty is best to be at the helm of, of a group like this? Um, I think the clinical specialty with a bleeding heart, quite honestly, <laughs> I hate to say it. <laughs> um, I, you know, certainly, you know, if you look at how to heal a wound, number one on that list is is perfusion. So certainly vascular surgery is an incredibly important role um, and sort of being critical about it. And I, and I do think you need a vascular surgeon involved who actually really thinks and believes in limb salvage because the sort of the, the strategy and thinking is quite different. You know, I, I, when I do a limb salvage revascularization, I will not quit until I see a blush at the wound, right? So you have to get all the way down to as pulsatile flow all the way down to the tip of the toe. While a lot of, you know, a lot of regular PAD is, okay, I revascularized to a beautiful AT. I don't really know what the pedal arch looks like. It's okay. Um, that being said, I, I think whoever, you know, whoever is willing and who's interested, you know, I think plastic surgeons, general surgeons, um, uh, podiatrists can certainly run or foot and ankle doctors could certainly run or be at the helm. It just happens to be that. Actually, I have a very close affiliation with a plastic surgeon here as well, who's a, the co-medical director for the Wound Care Center. He's also quite involved. So we have a good, good, good group. And how does one go about starting this? I mean, I'm assuming this didn't all fall into place. So <laughs> that's a great question. Um, you know, I think we were sort of doing it in a haphazard way just by having a wound care center. And like I said, I was, you know, calling everybody up you know, calling the plastic surgeon, calling the ID doctor, and I was the one doing it. And what I was finding was because I was getting busier and busier and busier, things were a little bit slipping through the cracks. And um, the way to get resources is obviously to make a statement that makes financial sense. So I sort of went to the hospital administrators and I said, look at how we're doing this right now. See what's happening to these patients. And I have this slide, which I'm pretty proud of because it just showed like how these patients were getting around the system and who they were seeing and where they were starting and how it was going on. And what would happen is before they even got sort of a comprehensive care, they'd seen like four different specialists and it had been like four months. And I was like, this is, you know, costing money, it's taking time. And um, I think, you know, if we can coordinate this care, it'll result in better outcomes and faster care, um, less readmissions. That's a good money money point. Were you able to document that once uh, since you started? So, so yeah. So, well, we've been going for about a year formally with the, with the STEP program. But if you look sort of informally, I, I've looked at the data since our wound care center opened where our outcomes have no question improved. So we've done significantly less amputations, um, more revascularizations, which brings money to the hospital, and more minor amputations. With the STEP program as well, we're seeing an, an even increase increased decrease in amputations. Um, and we're working on sort of compiling the readmission and admission data. It just gets kind of, um, it's, it's tricky because there's a lot of different kinds of admissions, you know what I mean? <laughs> like hospital, the patients may be, there's, these are complex and sick patients. So, you know, exactly how to define that we're still working on. But that was the argument I made. And yes, I'm going to, and will be clearly documenting that with data. So I think we'll maybe jump now to a little bit more technical stuff as far as the, the revascularization. Um, and obviously you have an interest in advanced complex endovascular approach, but uh, um, do you have an opinion on early bypass versus an endo, pro an endo first approach in your patients and, and how do you select them for that? You know, um, I would say full disclosure, I'm like a you know, I'm a, I'm an endo junkie. Um, I think these patients are so complex and they're so sick and they're so frail and they usually very often have pretty significant outflow disease all the way down to the tips of their toes. So, you know, a lot of diabetics, a lot of end stage renal disease patients. So, you know, I always, you know, I, you know, the, 
typical nice juicy sort of just femme distal in the um, a traditional pattern, I don't see a lot of patients that I think would do great because like I mentioned, my philosophy is I want maximal pulsatile flow all the way down to the wound with a blush at the wound base. So that's my opinion. And so I, you know, I like the idea of an endo approach because I think you can revascularize more than one tibial. You can revascularize the pedal arch. You can, you know, you can, and you can take them through pretty complex revascularizations with um, less morbidity. And so I am pretty endo heavy, but if they have a good, if they actually have our good bypass candidate, I'm not opposed to it. I just, I find my patients are, you know, they're just, not that straightforward. <laughs> Dr. Chandra, do you think there's any role in some of these patients for early amputation just to prevent, you know, additional procedures, et cetera, the patients that you see might benefit from, you know, they're going that down that road anyway? So I have to say I absolutely think so. I, and, and there's early amputation and there's early amputation, right? So there's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge partial foot or, you know, partial foot amputation advocate. Like, don't wait around for your osteo to climb up your foot. Just take your toe off or take your toes off and move on with your life. Um, and I think that's, you know, been shown, we can, we've shown a very substantial increase in partial foot amputations with a decrease in major amputations. I do believe if you talk about major amputations, fundamentally, I think there are some patients who you know, you know those patients, right, that are, happen to just have really bad diabetes, otherwise are actually quite young and strong and have lots of good resources. There, And there's no question, I have a patient right now that I've been treating for two years. Um, and I've talked to him at length about amputation. And I think he would have, I mean, he would no question he'd be running marathons right now if we had gone to early amputation. And the part of the STEP program, you know, having palliative care there, and I think having, you know, some social work conversations and some um, even, even referral to psychology has been, is important because no matter what, even though, even though you can argue that you're you know, you'll be back to a regular quality of life faster, potentially. There is something so emotionally traumatic about an amputation that I haven't found too many people that are willing to do that. Um, I can't tell you how often people are just willing to just keep fighting forever. Um, and I'm, I, I mean, you just have to, you know, do what they want to do at some point, but but I've always fundamentally thought I send them to the prosthetist who's great. He's just like, look at this is what it's going to be like. And here, look at all these people. You can meet these people who are like running marathons after an amputation. Yet people still rarely go down that line. Even with the peers. I, I find peers are sometimes helpful, but that's more in patients who have sort of committed, but they're like depressed about the possibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I always, I've always thought that strategy would be helpful, but it's... It's rare. It's the rare person that's like, you know, let's just move on. I just want to move on with my life. I want an amputation. It's amazing to me. I think I personally probably would be that way, but it's hard to know unless I'm in that situation. We often talk about vascular surgeons being some of the uh, best palliative care doctors <laughs> just because of what we deal with. But do you find the actual palliative care trained physicians have better luck at talking to these patients about this? You know, I have to say that I think that's such a wise point. You know, what we are dealing with an end stage disease, really, we are dealing with people that um, this is not really like systemic vascular disease is not curative, right? And that was very eye opening to me. It, it, the, the, my affiliation with palliative care came with this one patient who I just adored. She was this lovely ninety year old um, Filipino woman with a with nine kids that literally half of them, at least half of them, were with her at all times. And um, you know, I did bilateral bypasses on her for severe rest pain, and um, I did just so many interventions. And ultimately, I couldn't save one of her legs, or and she had an amputation. And that family came after the amputation, and they hugged me and brought me gifts and were so thankful because I had like sort of definitively gotten her, their mom out of suffering and pain. And, and to me, it was very painful because I was like, I failed. Why are you thinking me? I failed. In my mind, I'd failed, you know? And that was when actually I started talking to palliative care because really what I should have done is backed up and really thought, well, what was affecting this patient was her pain and suffering. She had a lot of resources and care. And, you know, the amputation was was not really a failure. It was actually being able to move on and be comfortable and manage her symptoms, which is, you know, a lot of what palliative care is all about. So that was really what opened my eyes in terms of how to think about these patients. And I think I'm trying to be more palliative 
approach, um, but I learn a lot from having palliative care around as well and the questions they ask. You know, I think also um, there's one thing that patients feel is that, you know, in a case like this where you've done a lot of different things and you end up with an amputation, is that you're also committed to them, you know, and I think that they feel that that goes, that goes a long way towards their, like, gratitude, you know? Absolutely. Because you've absolutely. gone through the whole process with them and you've been there with them the whole time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, though, because I, I yeah, I, I think our personal, like, getting over my personal feeling of, hey, that was a failure is, is, is not that straightforward. Yes, you know? yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then with your work with the prosthetist, you know, any advancements in the prosthetic technology that kind of changes your discussion about amputations? You know, they're becoming increasingly sophisticated. Um, unfortunately, some of the challenges are um, is related to insurance um, coverage and payment for some of these because the the more sophisticated ones can also come with a price. Um, and not a lot of these patients have a ton of resources, unfortunately. Um, but the, the, the prosthetist, I think, is unbelievably helpful in a group like this because he really gives perspective. Like, for me, you know, if there's a patient who we keep sort of whacking off part of their foot and, you know, what kind of, you know, function will this person have if we keep doing this versus a BK and what kind of function with what kind of prosthetic would they have with a with a BK or an AK, that sort of thing. Those questions absolutely need to be sort of weighed in as we think about the strategy for those patients. And so so the our prosthetist is incredibly helpful from that perspective. And yeah, I mean I think the 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 technology is just continuing to get really advanced. It's just whether or not my patients have the resources to get the super advanced technologies. <laughs> Let's move this discussion into the operating room a little bit. Um, tell us what you think about pedal or tibial, you know, retrograde kind of alternative accesses. I'm a believer um, because I have to. Um, I, uh, um, I'm, you can ask the people in my cath lab, which it used to be like Friday night that I would do these patients <laughs> somehow. So annoying. Um, at least now it's kind of moved more to Tuesday or Thursday evenings, but everyone knows like we're going to be here late. It's a tibial day for Vanita. Um, I, I am a bleeding heart. I, I, I truly think that if you're going to take these patients on, the goal should try to be to get pulsatile flow with a blush to the area of the wound bed and in whatever strategy you can. So, you know, so many patients, we've all seen these patients, right, with barren feet or, you know, things are just kind of gone, sort of mid-calf and below. Um, it doesn't make me stop. I'll, you know, put an ultrasound down if I see any kind of lumen on a pedal vessel, I'll try retrograde. I'll just try sort of blindly to get across a, um, an occluded um, tibial and see if I can get into the foot. I will try anything. So I'm a believer. I think that I've been amazed by how little sort of, you know, we, everybody worries about you're taking away the pedal target for a bypass or a tibial target for a bypass. I've really not found that to be a problem. But I also, again, like I mentioned, I see these patients with, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing to even bypass to um, a lot of the times, and so uh, those. That's sort of a different ball game. And then, uh, how about your thoughts on uh, drug eluding stents or drug coated balloons? Has your practice changed? <laughs> I may, <laughs> I may have to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> I think I did some technology development stuff in the in the past, um, and I'm pretty like one of the reasons I love astro surgery is because I I love the idea of sort of new technology development. I'm sort of un amazed by what little stuff I have to work with below the knee, right? We just really don't have a lot of technology. We don't have any great tools. Um, and the reality is, is I'm not sure, and I tell my patients this, I don't really care about patency. I just care about wound healing and limb salvage. And so I just have to kind of get you there. I was a, I'm a big believer. I mean, drug eluding technology seemed to make a lot of sense to me. Um, and, but unfortunately, you know, I think we have to be critical about our, about all we, you know, what we have out there. And I, I don't think we, I haven't changed my habits yet, but I do look forward to some sort of good, more clinical, specific evaluation of these technologies and these tools. I don't think it's gone. I think we just have to figure out what, what these signals are we're seeing right now. So what clinical situation will you use, like a drug coated balloon then? Um, I don't like to, I, I like to stay away from uh, stenting, particularly sort of below the knee, TP okay. trunk, distal pop. So that's where I'm probably most often using drug eluding technology still. Will you use it for primary disease or do you use it for stenosis? Mm -hmm. Even primary disease. Even primary disease. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel the same way, and I'm, I, I was a fan of the the drug elution technology, so I'm I'm a little, you know, 
um, perturbed by the findings, but I, I, they still have yet to be convinced that it's worth changing my practice. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, more on this soon. You're going to have to do a podcast just on this topic. I think Absolutely. in a year. We can never come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what about? I mean, you, you mentioned that you don't feel like you have much to work with below the knee. Um, how do you feel about using stents in tibials and I've even seen stents in DPS? Um, I don't, quite honestly. I mean, you know, I, I actually, if you look, and I've looked at this, if you look at the data, there is actually a few studies out there that look at tibial drug eluting stents, and it's usually, you know, off-label coronary stents that were placed in the tibials, and oh, it's not usually, it's all we have, and, um, and the data is actually not bad. But I think the reason why the data is not bad is because it's not realistic. It's like the, you know, the isolated sort of short little focal dissection that they treat. Because, you know, you've seen those coronary stents are short. And then you've seen these patients with tibial disease that need limb salvage. They're like entire ATPTs out, right? So we're not going to, I mean, if there's like a focal little thing that you have a focal dissection that seems to be flow limiting, I'm not opposed to it. Um, but that's not really a situation you see that often. And so, you know, I don't know. I was kind of excited for a while, the whole concept of the um, bioabsorbable stent. I don't know what happened to that. I mean, I, I, I think we need some technological advancement. It's just we haven't had much. Uh, I want to shift gears one more time uh, over into education since you're the, you know, also part of the fellowship program there. The fellowship um, and residency. We have a residency here too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, so uh, let's start with that. maybe telling us if there's something about your fellowship or your residency um, that you think does really well that you think other programs might benefit from incorporating. Um, we're just, it's the best, it's the best. You guys all should come here. It's I mean, what else? It's the best West Coast program. It's the best West Coast. Okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> have you, um, have you guys been to Palo Alto? Do you guys know what I'm talking about here? Um, I don't, you know, I think there's a lot of features. I think there's a lot of great programs out there. I don't mean to be biased. I'm kidding. But, um, but I think there's a lot of features that we're really proud of. Um, first of all, we all really care about education. We all really um, I mean, that's why we stay in a program like this, right, or in a place like this is because that's really how you make an impact on the future, in my opinion, is is making an impact on the um, on the trainees. Um, we have a, a, a very busy tertiary care hospital. We have a county hospital and we have a VA hospital that's all part of the training experience. And I think that's actually really helpful to have that variety. Um, in terms of different attendings as well as different um, sort of clinical scenarios and, and patient populations. And so I think that actually provides a fair amount of richness to their education. Um, those are the main things we, you know, obviously it's fun being in a place like Stanford and, and being, and, you know, being involved in a lot of the clinical trials and things like that. So we can, I think we can offer um, a, a well-rounded and sort of modern uh, training. Sure. And then uh, what kind of advice do you offer uh, fellows when they start with you or residents when they start with you and how to get the most out of a, a vascular surgery training? You know, I do advise or warn um, trainees, or maybe I should do it more often than I do, is that there's a million ways. And I think this is the beauty of vascular surgery, right? There's a million ways to do everything. You're going to take 10, patient, 10 vascular surgeons and put them in the room and put in a clinical case they're all going to do it just slightly differently with their own little nuances and doesn't mean any of them are wrong or right. And I think that's the complexity and challenge of, of learning in vascular surgery. I remember being a fellow and being like, well, so-and-so would do it this way and so-and-so would do it this way. And so the key advice I have is the goal of this is to to figure out how you're going to do it and take the, what makes the most sense from all of the different approaches and put it together in your algorithm. And that's judgment, which is the hardest thing to teach and the hardest thing to learn, right? The technical aspect is the easy part. You can teach a monkey to operate, but it's that strategizing and thinking and coming up with an algorithm in your mind for each thing. That's the hard part. And especially hard if you are trained by 10 different people that do it 10 different ways. So um, you have both a uh, integrated residency and a traditional fellowship, and you graduated from a traditional fellowship. Do you have any thoughts on on the benefits of either or both? Having is it is it a good thing to have both in the same setting? So the year I graduated was the first year that we at Stanford had two graduates. So we had a fellow graduate and a and a resident graduate. So really, my sort of senior level or fellowship years were the first time there was a senior level resident. We were one of the sort of 
pretty early adopters of the residency program. And so I think from personal experience, I have an opinion about this, which is it's really great. I think they're, it's really synergistic to have both, actually. I remember when I started and I, you know, I, I did my residency training here and I did a fair amount of vascular surgery during that training program, but you cannot compare like the few months or, you know, multiple months that you get in a general surgery training program in vascular surgery to a vascular surgery resident who's lived, breathed, and thought about vascular surgery for three and a half years, right? Or three years by the time they get to their fourth year. So when I started as a fellow, I was on call the very first weekend. And of course, a rupture comes in on 4th of July. And I'm like, I don't even know where anything is. I don't know even what to do, you know, and I called up my co-resident and he like walked me through it because he'd been doing it for three years. On the other side of it, you know, we were doing this open aneurysm and with this like extensive lysis of adhesions. And I walked him through that. So I think, I think that it's really synergistic and, um, and, and I, I fundamentally, obviously, because I'm biased and, and did the traditional pathway, I fundamentally believe that pathway should continue. And I think in general, as in our specialty, we've decided to continue it. Um, at the end of the day, I think both are very well-trained. Yeah, I would, I would a hundred percent agree with what you say. You know, it's interesting. I had a conversation last week with one of the program directors in, in Michigan who was saying that, you know, they had gone to a, a integrated residency and at the request of their integrated residents and they had phased out the traditional fellowship and within six months, the integrated residents were sort of begging them to have, a, to bring it back. Oh, um, is not interesting. Because of two things. One is the call and the, the, the clinical coverage was all of a sudden they had a lot more work to do. And two, they liked the mentorship that they had from the fellows. Um, and like you said, it's, it, there's a good synergy, uh, between residents who, you know, maybe a little bit more mature coming to vascular later versus residents who've been studying vascular the whole time. And, and I think it, I think it's better for all, better for training for all of them, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Al, let me ask you this, although I'm not supposed to be asking the questions, but all of you guys are either are fellowship trained. Would anyone, if you did it again, do the residency now? I think if I knew ahead of time in med school that vascular surgery was for me and that I would be uh, inclined to be good at it. Cause that was, for me, it was also a little intimidating when you're coming out of med school. You don't know if you'll be a, a good surgeon or not, if you can do the fine stuff. If I knew ahead of time, then the prospect of saving, uh, two years of training and making, uh, an attendings income two years earlier is very hard to turn down. You know, I mean, I love my training and I, and I, I think, uh, you know, um, it's great what I learned, but, uh, but there is a real practical consideration to it. You know, Medical training is, is delayed adolescence. And the longer we do it, you know, and we, we get, we accept, oh, yeah, fine, I could do another year. I can do another two, three years. Um, but, you know, one, all of a sudden you're middle aged, you know? So I wouldn't do it any other way. That's, that's what you have to keep telling yourself when you're going through it. <laughs> Saying that, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased with my training and, and I'm, I'm very happy with it. But, the, but I do think that both ways are good. I totally agree. So any thoughts on how to promote uh, diversity within vascular trainees and uh, within the field of vascular surgery? First of all, I think there is no question and no one would argue with this that diversity is good and it's imperative. Um, I think that as um, medical schools and um, residency programs are becoming more diverse and they have been, it's striking or had been striking for a while how surgical specialties and vascular surgery being one of them weren't sort of um, adopting that diversity as rapidly. Um, and I think that's been shown, but I think it's changing. I think it's just a slower change, but I think it's changing. Um, and, you know, the, the, it helps the more diverse leadership and sort of more seasoned um, people in the society people see, I think that the more, it, um, uh, the more diverse interest we have, but, you know, I mean, if you just look at, Male female uh, ratios, they're dramatically changing. Um, you know, when I joined the SVS, the membership or the percentage of women in the SVS was 8%, 8%. Um, but if you looked at the um, Members, members that were under 40, I think it was something more like closer to 20%. And then if you now look at the number of people or the percentage of women that are going into vascular surgery training programs, you know, it's 37%. So this is changing and it's going to be changing rapidly. And that's just, you know, one element of diversity. But, um, but I think we have to, we have to pay attention to it. And uh, how about, uh, you know, supporting, you know, we have our, our vascular patients are, are sort of very diverse as well. And I think um, 
there's an argument for improvements in patient care by by increasing the diversity in our in our in our in our workforce, you know. I totally agree. But I'll tell you on the other hand of it, like there's certain things that drive me nuts. Like some people were like when I was first training, I, I you know, my my boss who's really so thoughtful and um was is always has always been such a great support of me. He was he was always concerned. He's like, Who's your female mentor? And I was like, I don't need I, I, I don't do you tell the guys who's your male mentor? Like it doesn't matter. A mentor is a mentor and that just drives me crazy. And and um and I had a lot of patients who are like, I must have a female doctor. And I I don't know. I just I personally don't think that way. I get that people feel that way. I personally think you want to go to the best doctor or best surgeon for you. You want to have the best mentor, um, best person for you. It doesn't necessarily matter what their you know background is. Absolutely, but but I think it helps to have a diversity of, of perspectives in the community as a whole. Absolutely, so people are at least aware of those things. You know, so I totally agree. And and in the leadership, right? I mean, if the, if the leadership and the and sort of the thinking of the, our society is not diverse, then it's just not going to promote it. So I, I agree with you on that. Dr. Shana, what about, is there something that you think is very exciting about the field of vascular surgery right now that all trainees should be aware about? I have, I always preface when people ask me questions about, you know, wellness or how you, how, my, how am I doing and do I like my job by telling them that my husband calls me pathologically happy. So I think I'm definitely a glass half full person, <laughs> but, you know, I can't imagine a better field. And I mean, you know, the fact that we are so cutting edge, that we have so much exciting technological advances, the fact that we have these long-term relationships with the patients, the fact that we're doing these life altering or life saving procedures. I mean, it's just, it's just an, an unbelievably exciting and relevant and modern and changing field. And so I, I think there's nothing better, but obviously I'm biased. You know, there's a question we ask a lot of our, our faculty, and this is one of the things I look forward most to, to learning from is any useful techniques that's gotten a, gotten you out of a bind in the operating room? Anything that's like saved you in the middle of the night or whatever, you know? We had a visiting, uh, or Sam Money came to visit us and he was hanging out in the cath lab and we had to do this like catheter exchange um, and the wire was just not quite long enough. And he's like, just grab saline and like flush from the back while you're like pulling it out. And I was like, oh my God, that's such a great trick. So I've like totally adopted it yeah. and I totally get loving these little tricks, but I'm not sure I can think of another one right that's now. That's okay. Well, that's a useful one right there. You're there you go. You've got that one, but it's Sam Money's, but that's okay. At least I'm giving that's him credit. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are very few, very few original ideas in surgery. So at least you give credit. So you take a, so if your wire is too short to like basically, you know, get wire right out of the sheath while you're pulling your catheter out, do you know what I mean? If you don't want to lose wire access, you can sort of flush from the back of the sheath with some saline, just, just sort of keep nudging the wire in while you, while you pull the catheter out. That way you can sort of keep your, your wire in there without pulling the wire out as you're pulling the catheter out by flushing saline in there. It works best for like a glide wire sort of situation. But you don't want to flush too hard because you don't yes. want to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> then you have to be chasing the wire. You know? Yeah, I should yeah. be careful what I'm yeah, exactly. <laughs> teaching here. Exactly. Darshana, what do you like to listen to in the operating room? Um, I love old school hip hop. I'm a hip hop barbecue kind of girl. It's funny because my fellows know that, like, I, I'm obsessed with hip hop barbecue. It's like my favorite thing to listen to, although they beg me to listen to other things sometimes. Um, but you know if the operation is going too long because I don't know if you guys have listened to the hip hop barbecue like playlist, like on Pandora or something. But like, as you go on in time, it gets like a little like more hardcore, a little <laughs> raunchier, and like I get a little more agitated because there's like more swear words, and then the fellows like, okay, oh, yeah, we got to get you out of this operating room. <laughs> you have to worry about the scrub nurse who's like 65 and, and oh like, i know yes, exactly. oh i know i'm constantly apologizing i apologize if anyone is unhappy with my music choice we can change it <laughs> just tell me right now <laughs> and what do you like to do in your free time when you're not in the operating room well i have two amazing kids they're nine and six so we like to hang out um and i'm a big um i, I love to ski um we live close to the mountains here so we try to get out um as much as possible um, and I am a sort of a workout um, addict, I will admit. Um, and so I like to I like to sort of stay active and healthy. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a fantastic discussion. My pleasure. It's fun. Yeah, thank you very much, man. It was lots of fun. Lots of fun. You guys have a great day. We are Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. You can find us on social media at Audible Bleeding or online at audiblebleeding.com.